Hello, I'm Lou Ann Johnson, and I'm speaking to you from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. First, I would like to say hello to all my teacher friends in Thailand and say thank you so much for choosing to teach. I know it's not the easiest job in the world and not the best paid, and we don't get the most appreciation, but as you know, it can be the most satisfying job in the world in spite of the frustrations. In connection with the publication of my book, Teaching Outside the Box, I'd like to talk just real briefly about three issues that I think are of universal interest to teachers everywhere. Number one is the motivation to work with those students who, who are so disruptive and so difficult. Sometimes I know it's tempting to just throw up our hands and say there's nothing we can do, but I always remind myself that there is a reason for everything that a child does. So rather than try to stop the behavior, my first response always is, why is this student acting this way? And my question always is, have I done something to make this student believe that this behavior is acceptable or necessary? Many times it's easier to blame the student when sometimes it's something that the teacher's doing. For example, when I first began teaching, I often would take role at the beginning of the class and students became disruptive, and then when I wanted them to pay attention, I had a hard time getting them to settle down. And then a teacher, another teacher observed my class and said, they perceive that you're not ready or that you're busy, so that's their personal time, and then when you ask them to pay attention, it's like you're interrupting them. So be prepared from the second that you walk into the room or that they walk into the room that you're ready to teach and take role as they do something else. Give them something to do and train them so that every time they walk into your room there's something posted, there's a direction, instruction, and they know exactly what to do. It only takes a couple of days and they get into the routine. It becomes a habit. As soon as they come into your room they get a piece of paper and they write in their journal or they read an article and formulate questions or they do some math problems. They do something, not just busy work, but something that we're going to discuss and something we're going to use and then they, it becomes just a habit. They walk into the classroom and their brains engage. And while they're doing that, then I can take role and then I'm ready to teach. And it stops a lot of misbehaviors. Issue number two is the biggie, discipline. I do know some teachers who successfully involve students in creating the rules for their classroom, but I'm not one of those teachers. I make the rules. It's my classroom, and at the, especially at the beginning of the year, or a term, when students come into the classroom, I want them to understand, this is my classroom, not yours. I have high expectations for behavior and for academic performance. I don't put a list of rules on the wall, and I don't threaten them, I don't go over all the things I'm going to do in response to what, bad behavior. I think of it the way you raise a child at home. I don't have a list of rules on the wall, and, and consequences. What happens at home when a child does something? We say, we don't do that. And in the best circumstance, we explain why. Sometimes they're too young to understand, but I still try to give them an explanation. We don't run with scissors because someone could get hurt. We don't call people names because no one likes to have their feelings hurt and it, and it disrupts their learning. So when someone misbehaves or does something that I think is, is um, going to be disruptive, I say, we don't do that in this room for this reason. Thank you very much. And I go on. If the student repeats the behavior, I stop. I do the same thing a parent would do. I give them the look. Didn't I just tell you not to do that? Please remember. Thank you very much. And then I go on. If they do it the third time, then I will have a private conversation with that student. But unless students are very, very young, I don't call their parents because parents don't tell children to go to school and misbehave. So they've already told them to behave and it didn't happen. I try to hold the student responsible. And that's one of the reasons why I don't do a lot of detentions, I don't do a lot of punishments. Because those don't change behavior long term. I hold the students responsible for their behavior. I don't want to be responsible. If I, if I create um, demerits or detentions, then I have to babysit or I have to keep track of that. If I start calling parents, then I have to follow up on that. And it just creates a lot of uh, negative dynamics. So what I do is I talk to the student. Why are you doing what you're doing? If they don't know why they're doing, then I say, you need to step over here quietly and think about what you're doing. I would like you to change the behavior, 
This is specifically what I don't want you to do, specifically what I do want you to do. And then you decide what you're going to do when you're ready. In the meantime, I'm going to teach. So that they realize they don't get my attention for misbehaving. They get my attention for cooperating. And then when it's convenient for me and everyone's busy, I'll go to that student and I'll say, what do you think? It gives them a chance to calm down. Nobody's acting in anger. It doesn't make them so defensive. And in most cases, students uh, either don't understand why they're doing what they're doing because something emotional is going on in their life or somebody's teasing them or they're worried about something at home. Maybe they have bad nutrition. There's you know, a million reasons. But what I want them to understand is I want them to develop self-control. And they're not born with it. They have to learn it. So I just I try to be like the kind drill sergeant. I like you, I want you to stay in my classroom, but when you walk through that door, you accept the responsibility of being in my classroom, which means I expect you to do your best, not to interrupt other people when they're learning, and never to ever to interfere with my teaching, because I take my job very seriously. And most students understand that. Of course, you have students who have some severe issues, and those are the ones that need to talk to their counselors. Those are the ones that I can't fix. It took me a long time to admit that. I can't save them all, I can't fix them all, but I can do my best to be the best teacher, to be a good role model, to be as patient as possible, try never to respond out of anger, never feel like I want to punish a student or teach them a lesson or help them, make them, force them to make better choices. What I want them to do is think about what they're doing, choose what they're doing, and learn to control their behavior and accept full responsibility. I'm not responsible for their behavior, they are. The third issue is the standardized curriculum. And I, I'm sorry, but I just don't agree with making one test and one curriculum for every student everywhere. I do believe in some standards. I believe that no matter what country you live in, literacy is very important. Not just the ability to read and write, but the ability to read and write well. The ability to formulate ideas and express them in an articulate manner using proper grammar and to be able to write, to write those ideas down. So how you go about learning them depends, I think, on, in a community, in a, in a very urban environment with students that may be a little more savvy, uh, faster pace, that's a very different environment than working with children in a farmland, for example, or a place where you have a lot of people who are learning a new language. So I think that we have to give more trust to teachers. Teachers are trained. And we need, to, we need to value them and we need to trust them and allow them to do what they believe is best in order to teach their students. And understand that we do have these standards we expect you to meet, but I just don't agree with standardized exams and standardized uh, curriculum, particularly that. I don't have a problem with having an exam, but here's my problem. On paper, for example, drivers, many millions of people can, can do the test. They can pass a written exam. They can pass an oral exam. They can even drive around the block with an instructor. That doesn't mean they're good drivers. That's why we have so many accidents. So I think that it's important that we, that we see what people can do, not just on paper, but what, the, what can they do. If I want to know if a student can really read, I want to hear them read, and then I want to talk to them about the book. I want them to discuss it with me. I think the best way to know if people can do something is ask them to do it, not on paper. Maybe I'm crazy, but I do my best, and I think that's what, what's important for teachers. We do our best, and we try to help every student. And I do want to say this. Sometimes it feels as though we're not making any progress with certain students, but we are. We may just be watering the plant. We may never see the blossom, but eventually those seeds of hope blossom. Thanks for teaching, and happy reading. I did want to say, if you have specific questions when you're reading my book, feel free to send me an email. There is an email link on my website, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Sometimes it takes me a while to get to them, but I won't ignore you. Thanks. Adiós.